Hello, welcome to the Live to 110 podcast. My name is Wendy Myers, and you can find me on LiveTo110.com, and you can find this video podcast on the YouTube channel at Wendy Live to 110. Today, we're going to be talking about the thyroid and how to heal the thyroid naturally, everything related to the thyroid, with our guest, Dr. Justin Marcagiani. Uh, he's a, a good friend of mine, and I was on his podcast a little while ago, and He's so knowledgeable. I just I really like him a lot, and I know you're going to love all the information he has to offer about the thyroid, healing it naturally, the supplements that you need to heal the thyroid, and everything you want to know about testing and how to interpret your test results so for all you biohackers out there. Just keep in mind that this program is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or health condition and is not a substitute for professional medical advice. The Live to 110 podcast is solely informational in nature, so please consult your healthcare practitioner before engaging in any treatment that we suggest today on the show. And I just got back from an amazing health conference uh, with my business partner that I'm starting my bio rehab supplement line with. Um, we went to the Baby Bathwater uh, Health Conference uh, put on by Michael Lovich, and it was really amazing. I met all kinds of amazing people, Padram Shojai and um, uh, Mark David of the Institute for Psychology of Eating. Uh, met just a lot of really amazing movers and shakers in the health field and made some great connections there. And uh, it was a lot of fun spending an entire weekend in Park City, Utah with them. Very, very interesting <laughs> to meet all these people in person that I'd been following for, you know, really for years um, on, on their blogs and their podcasts, etc. But really, I think my favorite person was Padrama Shojai, who was amazing. Met Leanne Ely of SavingDinner.com. She was a blast, just hilarious. And uh, met, uh, you know, Steve and uh, Jordan from SCDLifestyle.com. And just a lot of people that I've had on the podcast already. So it was very uh, enriching for me and really exciting, too. Uh, but I'll be, be gonna, definitely going to be going to more of those in the future and meeting my, my fellow brethren in health and uh, try to save the world with them. <laughs> so today our podcast guest is Dr. Justin Marcagiani. He's got an Italian last name. Uh, he started off his career in the health field working in a surgical center um, as he prepared for medical school at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, working in the surgical field gave him a first-hand, close-up perspective into the healthcare system. Um, he was able to see it where it shined, especially in the area of treating acute injuries and trauma, but he also shot, saw its shortcomings, uh, which are most evident in the areas of chronic disease, like you know diabetes, heart disease, and obesity, which are our biggest problems today. And this experience shifted his focus from conventional medicine to a more holistic and natural approach to healing where the underlying cause of his patient's health issues are addressed and not just medicated and surgically removed. Uh, Dr. Justin is a graduate of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst with a degree in kinesiology and pre-medical studies. He has completed his doctorate degree in chiropractic from Life West University and he has completed postgraduate study in the areas of clinical nutrition, rehabilitative exercise, and functional medicine so he can offer the most cutting-edge techniques to address his patients' growing healthcare needs. Dr. Justin works with a wide variety of patients, uh, all the way from athletes trying to increase performance to heal from injuries to so the everyday person with chronic health challenges. Uh, using a holistic approach, Dr. Justin addresses core underlying barriers to health, which allow his patients to heal faster and feel better. And his practice is located in Austin, Texas, one of my favorite cities. I'm from Texas. Uh, it's where my heart is. And um, he, But he has his practice all over the world. You can contact him from anywhere in the world to uh, use his services and become his patient. Justin, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much, Wendy. It's great to be here. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself and about your practice? So I have a clinic here in Austin, Texas, and I say 80 to 90% of the patients that I see are worldwide. Patients last week from Saudi Arabia and Europe and Italy and Australia, New Zealand. And with technology, we're able to do lab work and, and create programs and work with people worldwide, which is great. And typically, we're dealing a lot with uh, hormonal-related issues, thyroid issues, and uh, chronic GI issues, too. 
Yes, yes. Yeah, I had the same thing. I have I see patients or clients from all over the world and um, just uh, really very, uh, very enriching and very satisfying to be able to, to help so many people wherever they are in the yeah. world. Um, mm -hmm. So you're a chiropractor, correct? Yeah, my doctorate's in chiropractic medicine mm -hmm. and I've been, say about the last five or 10 years, really specialized more in functional medicine, especially the areas of the thyroid, uh, adrenals, and uh, chronic gut issues. Okay. And so why don't you tell the listeners, you know, if anyone's green out there, you know, what yeah. is a thyroid and uh, what are its functions in the body? So let's just cover some basics. So a thyroid is kind of part of the hormonal system. It's like our thermostat of our, of our body, if you will. It helps control metabolism. Uh, basically, every cell in our body needs a healthy level of metabolism to function. It's what allows us to break down food, to create energy, create heat, move, etc. And thyroid is an important piece, and the thyroid and the adrenal glands are kind of like a back and forth, kind of a brother and sister, if you will. The adrenals help manage stress and produce stress hormones that also help us deal with inflammation, produce sex hormones, which help us heal and be able to reproduce and be um, vital and healthy and young. And the thyroid gland produces this hormone called T4, which then gets converted a couple places throughout the body into T3, which is our, really our master thyroid hormone. Most people in the conventional world, when they talk about thyroid, they're really talking about TSH, which is a brain hormone. So when we talk about thyroid, we're referring to active T3 thyroid hormone, not just T4 or TSH. Yeah. And so what are some of the myopias in the typical testing that doctors do? Because um, I have so many clients, they come to me, hey, look at my medical test. And the doctor has only tested TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. What is yeah. the problem with only testing that one value? So TSH, like we, saw, like we talked about, is a pituitary hormone. So like kind of right, right behind the middle of your eyes there. And we have technology today where we can actually look at the actual thyroid hormone levels. Inactive, T4, or T3, which is your more active, about 400% more active. So 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, we were primarily diagnosing thyroid issues via TSH testing. And now in the last 50 years, we can actually look at the thyroid numbers on a you know one by one basis. So we kind of are at an antiquated level of diagnosing and, and prescribing thyroid hormone based on TSH. And how that works is your TSH is kind of like a, maybe a parent talking to their kid playing a video game. The parent starts raising their voice to get the kid's attention and then if they're not listening, they may raise the volume more and more and more. So that's kind of how the TSH works. The TSH starts at a, maybe a range of one to two would be a healthy, functional, normal range. And then it starts creeping up to a three, to a four. And then once you hit about 4.5 to five, then you're in the high range on a conventional setting. So it's this inverse hormone. It goes high when the thyroid hormone goes low. Yeah. And the problem with that is, is about, according to research, in between a five to 10 year gap for that TSH going high and there being a thyroid issue, meaning if you're high with TSH, it probably started five to 10 years ago. and the majority of thyroid issues, they tend to be autoimmune in nature. So there's an autoimmunity where the immune system is actually attacking its own self. And the reason why the thyroid function is going down is because of this self-attack. And that's always, almost always being missed in a conventional setting, unless it's very extreme. Yeah, and it's amazing to me where a doctor's old test the TSH and just look at that as the, the single markers, uh, if someone has a thyroid problem or not. So why not do the entire panel with the, the yeah. autoimmune antibodies, et cetera, just to be yeah. on the safe side. And, and also it's frustrating because a lot of doctors, you know, you know, the patients are at the mercy of their doctor's advice. They won't yeah. even think of treating a thyroid issue unless the TSH is at five or six, when clearly a TSH of a three or four is a subclinical issue. I mean, why wait? until your thyroid is just completely toast, <laughs> your TSH is toast until you begin treatment. Yeah, the American College of Endocrinology back in 2003 said we should lower the standards to 2.5 on the TSH. Mm -hmm. So it's been clear that really anything 2.5 or above, we should start looking at it a little bit closer. And again, the TSH, why isn't the TSH good enough? Well, it's a late stage marker. The receptor sites in the pituitary are much more sensitive to detecting 
um, thyroid hormone than the other cells in our body. So I, my analogy for that is it's like going outside on a hot day and touching the sidewalk to try to figure out what the temperature is outside. We know the sidewalk's going to absorb more heat and it's going to be more sensitive to touch, mm -hmm. right? So we can get a better indicator by just pulling up our iPhone and pulling up the weather app versus touching a really hot sidewalk. So it's the same thing. The TSH, the brain's going to be more sensitive to the thyroid hormone, so we're going to be um, getting a indirect measurement on that. So once TSH is high, it's a problem. But now the issue becomes once you start giving thyroid support, it may come down super low in response to the thyroid support. But when we look at the actual thyroid hormone ranges, they may be perfect in range. Yeah. And that's the problem. Once you start giving thyroid support to someone that actually needs it, the pituitary will no longer be a good indicator of a thyroid issue. It's a great indicator of an issue off the bat, but a very late stage indicator of an issue. Yeah. So if you have high TSHs, you definitely need to be working with someone. But if your TSH is now low after treatment, you've got to look deeper at how the thyroid hormones are converting T4, T3, reverse T3, and your antibodies too. Yeah, that's a very, uh, very good distinction. Thank you for that. Yeah. And also let's talk about, about reverse T3. Um, this mm -hmm. is another uh, market a lot of doctors don't test. Can you talk about the importance of reverse T3 and what that means to your thyroid? Yeah, reverse T3 is a metabolically inactive uh, hormone. It's basically your body's way of putting metabolic blanks in your metabolic gun, if you will. So imagine you get your gun, you put your bullets in it, right? You fire those. Those are active bullets. You can, you can do something with those guys. Now, your body, to slow the metabolism down, puts metabolic blanks in. So it, it kind of fits in that receptor site. It goes in that uh, cartridge, if you will, that magazine, but it doesn't have the metabolic effect that that live bullet or that that live thyroid hormone will have. Yeah. And so it's your body's way of filling up receptor sites. So it's like when you come home from work, you know, you put your key and your lock in the front door and you open the door up. That's how it, it functions. And the body knows that and will kind of gum up the lock so you can't put that metabolic key in the lock and create a metabolic effect. Yeah. And so why, why would someone have high reverse T3? Oh, great. So that's your body's kind of way of saying, hey, your stress slow down, right? So part of the reason why you start getting tired is your body's like, hey, you know, our stress handling systems, our thyroid, our, we're inflamed. We got to create, we got to actually focus more on healing. So it slows the body down as a way to kind of cultivate healing inward. But us, we just kind of, you know, us meaning not me and you because we get it. But just the average person out there says, well, more stimulants and, and more willpower and just, you know, more drive, more ambition and, you know, Red Bulls. Like, that's how we're going to fix that, but it's not. We kind of have to look in and adjust what we're doing food-wise, lifestyle-wise, exercise-wise, and even supplement-wise, too. I know for myself, I'm always looking for indicators of, of toxins and heavy metal toxicities uh, in various medical tests. And one of them is reverse T3. When that's over 10, definitely a sign of heavy metal and chemical toxicity as well. Um, so that's something interesting for, you know, for patients to note when they're looking at their own uh, thyroid tests. Yeah, reverse T3 is important. Um, there's been some research showing that selenium helps with reverse T3. Selenium is also a precursor to glutathione. Mm -hmm. Also on your um, conventional blood test, an RDW over 13 can also be an indicator of lower selenium, which also connects down to the reverse T3 pathway. Mm -hmm. And stressed out adrenals, people yeah. that have elevated cortisol or depressed cortisol, you know, on the two extremes, that can be a good indicator that uh, are good contributing factor to reverse T3 as well. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit about the adrenal thyroid connection and how they work together in concert? And typically, when people have a thyroid issue, they're almost always going to have an adrenal issue as well because those systems work together. Yeah, if cortisol goes too high, that's going to create more reverse T3. If cortisol goes too low, that can also create your body can, as the defense, create more reverse T3 reverse T3. So high or low, we can get more reverse T3s. Also, high cortisol, we can also cause TSH dysregulation. Our body may start actually increasing TSH or decreasing it. So when we have this super high amount of stress hormone, our pituitary can either go really high, which means the glands aren't listening, there's a, a lack of communication, or it can go really low where it's just kind of given up and said, whatever, you know, you guys do your thing. Kind of like the parent just you know, walking out of the room saying, I, I give up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then also, uh, on top of that, um, like we mentioned, cortisol is needed for thyroid hormone conversion. So if we don't have healthy levels of it, we're not going to be able to convert T4 to T3 properly. And if 
We also need cortisol, healthy levels of cortisol for detoxification. And we also need it for building our gut lining. And we need it for um, just being able to regulate inflammation. Yeah. So if, if our cortisols are just totally out of balance and we're inflamed, well, we're not going to be able to regulate inflammation. And again, we don't want to throw gasoline on the fire by giving more cortisol, but we want to fix those underlying stressors that are contributing to that inflammatory fire and then provide the adrenal support so we can address it ourselves too. Yeah, and I think it's really important for anyone listening to this that's concerned about their thyroid. You can't just treat your thyroid um, uh, by itself. Um, it's a sign of a systemic issue of adrenal fatigue. I believe the root cause of disease is adrenal fatigue. Starts this domino effect of other yeah. health issues in the body. So you really have to be focused on healing your entire body and doing uh, the foundational work with uh, you know nutrients and minerals, et cetera, and not just focusing on trying to heal your thyroid. It just doesn't work like that. Yeah, many people are also nutrient deficient. So your zinc and your magnesium and your selenium and and all these really important nutrients are needed for healthy thyroid conversion as well. And um, we need the adrenals for healthy sex hormone output. So DHEA, DHEA sulfate is really important for our body rebuilding. Yeah. And if we're inflamed, we need those building blocks to heal, right? Our, our adrenals are hardwired to deal with the stress in the moment versus the healing of tomorrow. That's kind of how we just evolved. And if we're chronically in stress, well, tomorrow never comes, right? Because we're always in the stressful state, so we never get that ability to heal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's why it's so important to try to get enough sleep every night and try to do meditation and yoga yeah. and all these things to uh, counteract our very, very stressful lives and doing everything you can to minimize stress, like getting rid of EMFs, or re reducing uh, you know, exposure to EMFs, and just so many little things, so many little tweaks and biohacks that you can do to reduce stress. I agree. Like with my patients, we're getting them on an anti-inflammatory diet, regulating blood sugar and sleep. And then from there, the first system is the hormones. And again, it's ATF, adrenals, thyroid, and female hormones, right? And I find most people with thyroid issues, the adrenal component is totally ignored. And they're just, they're actually made, being made worse because they may actually need thyroid support, but they're being put on thyroid support, which is actually causing them to burn through their cortisol faster, creating an even more deficient cortisol state. Yeah, and people don't realize that when you take uh, thyroid replacement hormones like Nature Thyroid or Synthroid, et cetera, uh, or Armor Thyroid, it actually pushes your adrenals. Um, it really sti oh, yeah. stimulates them and um, really can make your condition worse. Um, so I think that while well, thyroid hormone replacement, it does make sense for some people. Some people need it just to function, um, but it's yeah. not the end all be all. And there's many other things that you can do. Can you talk about some of those things that you can do to heal your thyroid and, and even get off your thyroid medication? Well, just off the bat, just to piggyback on top of that, uh, even Dr. David Brownstein, he talks about putting people on adrenal support for at least one, mo one month before adding in thyroid support. So it's that important. So I typically go with if someone really needs thyroid support off the bat, like it's it's clear, then they have to go on adrenal support concomitantly with the thyroid. We want to make sure it's timed up together. But I always at least start the adrenal support first. But if they have an overt thyroid issue, then we'll do both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, you know, really important also to let the listeners know that you don't have to be on thyroid medication for life. Like a lot of doctors will tell you every yeah. single client of mine, their doctor has told them once they start that they have to be on thyroid medication for life. That is a lie. Uh, you do not, unless you don't have a thyroid. Yeah, obviously you'll never be able to make it. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that and how, you know, you mm -hmm. would, uh, you address that and heal the thyroid so people don't have to be on thyroid medication for life? Yeah, so it depends on how long the thyroid gland has been destroyed. I work with patients that may have just a little bit of TPO or, or uh, T, TGB antibodies. These are various antibodies, uh, thyroid binding globin antibodies or thyroid peroxidase. These are compounds that help build thyroid hormone. And when we start making antibodies to it, we're attacking them and collateral damage happens to the thyroid as well. And we get these B cells, which are part of our immune system, and they infiltrate the thyroid gland and they create where these wonderful follicles are that hold thyroid hormone, they create fibrotic scar tissue. So fibrotic scar tissue means that that tissue is no longer functional. It's no longer active thyroid um, glandular. So when it comes to that, depending on how much destruction is there, depends on how much the patient can fully recover with or without thyroid hormone. Yeah. So typically, you know, if they've had thyroid 
um, TPOs in the thousands, you know, over over decade or two decades, that may indicate how much thyroid they need or how if they can recover. It really depends on how long the damage has been happening for, and what other things they're doing. Like if they're eating gluten or if they have infections or they have low nutrient levels or leaky gut. Well, if they don't get that fixed, yeah, they'll probably need thyroid hormone forever. But if we get to the root cause and if there's still some functional tissue that's still there, still viable, and we can help it heal, then we can get as much functional tissue back and then we can figure out what they actually need long term. And that changes from time to time too. Yeah. Yeah. And I've so, seen it go both ways though. It goes yeah. both ways. Some people do need, some do because it's been like 20 or 30 years and their tissue, their gland is just fried. And some can get back on. So it's like I kind of weigh it all individual. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It has to be on an individual basis. Um, but I have mm -hmm. heard of, of clients that uh, from other practitioners that have had, uh, you know, autoimmune thyroid issues for 20 years and were able to get off their thyroid medication. But I think that's probably a rare case. Yeah. Um, it can happen, though. I mean, there's new stuff coming out uh, on lasers, too, on lasers being used in the thyroid tissue to help regain it. So I think with some of these other things combined with it, and if we're doing all the other stuff right, is it's a good chance that we can at least regain more than if we didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, sure. absolutely. Yeah, and so let's talk about the diet that someone should have if they're trying to heal their thyroid. You mentioned avoiding gluten and dairy, and I think that's a, a very, very essential component if you have thyroid yeah. issues. Can you talk a little bit about why you want to avoid gluten and dairy? Well, I even go to a farther extreme. The first month or two months with patients that we know they have autoimmune thyroid issues, they're on an AIP or an autoimmune paleo diet mm -hmm. where we're actually cutting out all grains, um, not just like allowing rice and corn. We're cutting out all legumes. We're cutting out dairy, even ghee, and then also nuts, seeds, and nightshades. Nightshades being tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, and peppers, and even eggs for the first month. So basically, your diet is meat. It's non-starchy vegetables, maybe a little bit of safe starches like potato or plantains or yucca, and um, maybe some low-sugar fruit like berries, and then good healthy fats. So it's anti-inflammatory. Uh, low in toxins and nutrient dense. That's kind of the eating plan, and we're really focusing on stabilizing blood sugar, eating every four to five hours to make sure we're not having our adrenals come to the rescue to bring that blood sugar back up with a, a rush of adrenaline or cortisol. Yeah, so uh, intermittent fasting is out <laughs> if you're trying to heal your it, adrenals. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I mean, intermittent. I see a lot of people, especially females, they get into trouble with it. And I say use intermittent fasting on the weekends when it's a less stress day going on. You're, you're relaxing, you're walking the dog, you're watching a movie, you're reading a book. It's a more chill day. Do your IFs on those days where there's less stress going on. Yeah, yeah that's a very good tip. Yeah, because I think uh, I have a lot of female clients trying to lose weight. They've got thyroid issues. They're, they're desperately trying to do everything they can to lose yeah. weight because their metabolism isn't working. Their thyroid hormones are not working um, yeah. or they're absent. So uh, I think that's a very good tip that... Uh, you know, I know when I've tried intermittent fasting in the past, before I healed my thyroid and adrenals, um, I just couldn't do it. I my yeah. I could feel you could feel that rush, that adrenaline rush, and that is not good. That puts stress on your adrenals and thyroid, and that will interfere yes. in healing. Now that I've healed my adrenals and thyroid, I can do it, and I, I try to yeah. do it as many days as I can um, because I know ultimately it's good for autophagy and um, you know yeah. other other health benefits. But I can do it now. Um, but That's you good. it's you have to listen to your body. Uh, it's it's. An individual yeah thing. absolutely it's individual too some people are super sensitive like my I'm very very blood sugar sensitive um, so I don't do it too often maybe once or twice a week but get healthy first and then experiment yeah you're better off getting the inflammation down and then seeing what you can tolerate yeah everyone's completely different you I always mm -hmm. tell uh, you know clients and I'll work on the podcast that everyone has to do what works for them and you can't just read a book and just follow the book to the letter. It doesn't work for everyone. Everyone's different. So it's a yeah. It's a never-ending goose chase. <laughs> which and, people, exactly. And no then regarding wants, the diet piece. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, people don't want to hear that. They just want to follow a recipe in a book. And, exactly. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And then regarding the diet piece too, we were talking about, um, let's just get into the macro stuff. So you have like your high carb, your low carb, your high fat, your low fat. So I typically default to a more um, high fat, moderate protein, kind of low carb kind of stick and eating plan off the bat. And then from there, some people will do better with a little more carbs. So my general recommendation is 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrate per day, figuring out what works for you. And protein anywhere between a palm to a fist to a full hand, palm, full fist, full hand, three to six ounces per meal, depending on stress, activity level, workouts, digestion. 
So we kind of customize it and work out the macros, meaning protein, fat, and carbs, and you know what you need to be successful. And then regarding the glutens, well, the proteins, that um, amino acid sequence in the grains is very similar to the amino acid sequence in the thyroid tissue. And what happens, we get this mistaken case of uh, identity, um, molecular mimicry, as the medical uh, world calls it, where the antibodies that are going out to attack the gluten very similar to tissue. So it's like the police calling an APB for a, a black Honda Civic, and guess what? You're driving a black Honda Civic, but you aren't the criminal, and you get pulled over. Yeah. So that's kind of what happens with our immune system and the thyroid gland. I like that analogy. Good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah, and same things happen with dairy, uh, the proteins of dairy. Similar. Very, very similar to our thyroid. So those are just out. And pancreas. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, those yeah. are those are out. So I hate to break it to you guys. <laughs> if you have gluten and dairy, wheat, it's just by cutting out wheat, you're you've hit you know ninety percent of the battle. But that still yeah. rye, uh, n gluten, uh, oats that are not gluten free, uh, and barley are problematic as well. Absolutely, I agree. So you talked about some of the supplements that people need for their thyroid, and uh, there's certainly uh, different support that people need based on whether they have just rant basic, you know, hypothyroid or Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroid issues. So let's talk about some of the supplements that one would need for just basic general hypothyroid, low thyroid functioning. Right. So as long as we have all the adrenals issues supported, so that could be some nutrient support for the adrenals, B5, zinc. Um, vitamin C, your overall adaptogenic herbal support to help modulate cortisol. This could be like your ashwagandha, your rhodiola, bacopa, eleuthero, and then various precursor hormones like DHEA or pregnenolone and glandular tissue. As long as we have kind of the adrenal stuff dialed in, then we kind of graduate to the thyroid element. And if you have elevated TSH, you want to get a thyroid glandular on board, at least something with some hormone in it to bring that TSH down just from a med legal perspective. You don't want to get sued. So you want to make sure you either refer out to a practitioner. Again, I try to always avoid things like Synthroid or Levothroid or Levoxyl because it's synthetic T4. And one, there's some fillers in it that cause issues if you're autoimmune, which 50 to 90% of the population are. And even if you aren't testing for it on your TPO or TGB test, well, 40% are false um, negatives. So there's a good chance that you are even if you don't think you are. So we'd rather go with like a nature throid. My favorite's a West throid because it's got no lactose in it. Um, over, you know, even an armor. Armor still has some uh, cornstarch in there. So I'd much rather do a uh, West throid or a nature throid. And I have a, a glandular that I use in my clinic. That's one that I, I formulated that helps knock these numbers down really well and support the thyroid. So I use that primarily because I can ensure that there's no additives in it too. Yeah. Yeah, and let's talk about some of the glandulars. Um, I give all my clients glandulars if they tolerate them um, because yeah. they have the minerals in them uh, that help to nourish yeah. and regenerate the thyroid and adrenals. I don't like to give thyroid glandulars by themselves. I prefer to do adrenal and thyroid glandular and pituitary just to support the, the trio, the mm -hmm. HPA access. Um, mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about you know why we want to take glandulars? Yeah, glandulars are phenomenal. Again, a lot of companies say they don't have active hormone in it. Again, I've seen lab tests that will say otherwise. So there are some potential active hormones in, in there, even if it's more at a homeopathic level. It's powerful. Again, the hormones, like you said, they contain the minerals. They contain the nutrients. Again, hello, why did the Eskimos not get scurvy up in, up in Antarctica? They got vitamin C, which is the deficiency called scurvy. They got vitamin C through eating the adrenal glandular tissue. So you can get lots of nutrients and lots of um, minerals and nutrition via the actual glandular tissue, which is great. And then also there's this kind of regenerating effect where it, it helps rebuild that gland in some, what they call it, protomorphogens or PMGs. There are these specific proteins that actually help trigger rebuilding of the gland. So using a glandular is powerful with the adrenals and the thyroid. I think a lot of people make mistakes and only do that as the core part of their program. I think as long as you have it as a part of your program, you're in a good place. Just don't make it the be all or end all. And then regarding, yeah, the pituitary, you can totally do glandulars for the pituitary and or just really good adaptogenic herbs. So one of my favorite herbs for the pituitary, for the uh, hypothalamus and pituitary is ashwagandha. Yeah. A lot of research on that helping with the HP axis and also it helps with T4 to T3 conversion. 
which is great. And it's very high in, it's really good um, for iron too with females. There's some good iron in there too. So if you're dealing with people that have thyroid issues and are anemic, especially, you know, our female patients, then that's going to be very helpful for that too. Yeah. Yeah. And also with the glandulars, um, there's a lot of schools of thought out there that people with Hashimoto's should be avoiding glandulars. And I'm not of that school of thought. I think people are, are very, very, uh, you know, have a lot of benefits with taking glandulars, even if they have Hashimoto's. What is your take on that? Yeah, I mean, there are some like, I think it's Lavoxyl. Um, there's one that has bovidine in it, and it, there's some iodine enriched into the glandular tissue. And again, I think some people may react to that. I always kind of base it on an individual basis. I think the majority of people can handle glandulars okay. They benefit from it. It really depends with the iodine. Now, my school thought with iodine, kind of piggybacking on that, is iodine with some people, if their autoimmunity is high, could potentially cause a problem. So the iodination process, which is where your body takes tyrosine, a molecule of tyrosine, and binds it to a molecule of iodine. So when you see T4, the T stands for tyrosine, and the 4 stands for four iodine molecules. And they get bound there by this deiodination or iodination process. And that process uh, spits out hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And hydrogen peroxide can be inflammatory and can create this whole B cell infiltration where the immune system starts coming in because of the inflammation. Now, if we have enough selenium on board, the selenium comes in there and pulls off an oxygen molecule, making it H2O. And it creates water, which we know is inert, probably beneficial. So we can reduce a lot of that inflammation with the iodine by just really supporting selenium. So my focus is the first three to six months, I don't do any additional iodine outside of the RDA if there's autoimmunity and we focus more on the selenium and the other nutrients so we cool down the inflammation and then get the inflammation down and then you can tweak the iodine a little more. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, and so um, I also like to give clients uh, pantothenic acid or B5. B5, um, cause, yeah. Because I find not so much for the thyroid, for the adrenal glands, anyone who has Great. adrenal fatigue or thyroid issues, they uh, lose a lot of B5 in the urine. So they need extra support, about 500 milligrams extra a day of B5. Absolutely, and also with a lot of my thyroid patients, you mentioned the HP axis. Well, part of the HP axis is the neurotransmitter dopamine. And we know dopamine can get converted downstream into adrenaline by stress. So one of the important things we need is B6, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, that allows our amino acids like L-tyrosine or 5-HTP to cross the blood-brain barrier and convert into serotonin and dopamine. And we need healthy dopamine levels for thyroid hormone activation. Dopamine talks to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus makes TRH. TRH talks to the pituitary, makes TSH. TSH goes to the thyroid, T4, T4 peripherally to T3. That's yeah. that adrenal hormone domino rally, okay. if you will. Yeah, and so let's talk about um, the supplements that are going to be good for someone with Hashimoto's. Um, are there any sp different nutrients that you, or that you like or avoid when someone specifically has autoimmune Hashimoto's? So off the bat, I would just be a little bit more ginger with iodine and just only give the RDA, which would be 150 to 250 uh, micrograms iodine and only give that that would be it no supplemental iodine I would really focus on at least 200 to 400 micrograms of selenium and then just all of the extra support we talked about the zinc 30 to 50 milligrams of zinc magnesium probably a half a gram of magnesium a lot of these could be found in a really good multi and or adrenal support too um, your zinc like I mentioned the b5 the b6 you know probably three grams of vitamin C per day and then all of your adaptogenic herbal support. So I typically go with a good quality multi, a good quality adrenal support uh, that has more adrenal-based nutrients, and then my herbs and my precursors and my glandulars. I kind of mesh them all together when I create a program for a patient. So when you're saying talking about iodine, you typically have uh, Hashimoto's patients avoid kelp? Yeah, I typically do that off the bat. Um, again, like there would be about 250 of micrograms of potassium iodide and multi I typically work with. I find that safe to be working with. It's when you get into the higher ranges, that's what I get really, um, really just on edge about because I've seen a lot of patients react and lose hair and have issues with higher levels of iodine. Yeah, okay. Er early on, early on for sure. Okay. Yeah, and so let's talk a little bit about uh, when blood tests are normal 
and clients are still having thyroid symptoms and thyroid issues, very clear indicators of thyroid dysfunction, but their tests are normal. Can you talk a little bit about why that would be? Well, most people that I see that say their tests are normal, they're typically just referring to TSH and maybe T4. All right, so most of the time we're not even talking about the free fraction of hormones. So about 98% of hormones are protein bound. So when we say T3 or T4, we're really talking about the protein bound hormones. That's, that's number one. Only 2% actually have the ability to, to park in the parking spot or put the key in the hole, if you will, right there, unbound so they can get in and they can bind in and have a metabolic effect. So we'd want to look at the T4 free. And then also from there, look at the conversion from T4 to T3. So for instance, my T4 ranges, I like 1 to 1.5 on T4 free. I like between 8 and 10, 7 and 10 on T4 total, above 100 and 100 to 160 on T3 total. I like reverse T3, you know, I below 15. I'll do the T3, reverse T3 to free T3 ratio, which is powerful. And I like my um, TSH below 2.5. Okay. That's a good general range for myself. Yeah, and, and I, then, I've, oh, go ahead. And then T3 uptake typically in the upper 20s, low 30s, 28, 29, 30. Okay. Yeah, and one interesting thing that I found with my client population is that when I have a, you know, a, a you know, good handful of clients that come to me that have totally normal thyroid tests, uh, I, they have the full range of tests and everything's normal, um, but they have the thyroid symptoms. And I found that when they have really high calcium levels in their tissues, which I see on a hair mineral analysis, you don't see it in blood, but you'll see it on a tissue test, like a hair mineral analysis. Yep. Um, this high calcium levels in their tissues will block the receptor sites in the cell membranes mm -hmm. and prevent thyroid hormone from getting into their cells to activate when they have plenty of it floating around. So this is a, another issue that, that people have. They need to balance their minerals uh, using a hair mineral analysis. Um, but why does this happen? Why do people get high levels of calcium levels in their tissues? Is because of adrenal fatigue. If there's a biochemical process that happens when people have adrenal fatigue and low sodium and potassium in their tissues where calcium will begin depositing in, metastatically in their tissues and this will uh, cause thyroid problems, uh, interestingly enough. Um, so they found that's an, another uh, a cause if you have normal thyroid tests and you're confused as to why you have all the, the whole gamut of thyroid symptoms, that's probably why. And that's called the calcium shield, right? Yes, or shell. Calcium shell. Uh, calcium shell, yeah. And that basically what you're saying is the imbalance in those adrenal nutrients, uh, they're low, which thus causes calcium to raise. And our body always puts calcium in the tissues that are inflamed, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Calcify joints and tissues and tendons and all that, leaches it from the bones and et cetera. Yes, yep, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it doesn't even have to be that high. Um, it can just, uh, the calcium doesn't have to be a complete calcium shell, um, but it does cause lots of problems. And it's very, very common because so many people have adrenal fatigue. Um, so I thought that's uh, really, really interesting. So let's talk about detoxification of the thyroid. And mm -hmm. I think this is another issue that even if thyroid tests are normal, you can still mm -hmm. have lots of toxins built up in your thyroid. Can you talk about mm -hmm. some of those toxins and how metals and chemicals affect thyroid functioning? Absolutely. So again, we have like things that are in the halide group. I think it's the seventh row on the periodic table. Don't quote me. Mm -hmm. um, but these are things like uh, fluorine or bromines. And these are going to come from, again, the bromines are going to come from Mountain Dew. It's going to come from breads. We, we used to iodize things, iodize things, and now we put bromine in a lot of our breads. And because that's in that same periodic table in that halide group, that can go in and kind of pinch hit um, for iodine, if you will. It can get into the receptor site and where iodine would kind of do its job, it can pinch hit for them and create problems. So that's a big one. Also, bromine's in a lot of the flame retardants, the PBDEs, polybrominated diphenyl ethers. That's a big one. So these are huge. Again, these typically are water soluble. So if we just avoid them, avoid the junk foods, avoid the breads, get healthy levels of iodine in, eat some good iodine rich foods, as long as we're not too inflamed, uh, this can kind of help displace a lot of that. Yeah. Also, fluoride. And they did a study, I think, just this last year. They looked at people, I think, in the UK, and they looked at two families or two, um, two different towns or districts. One was fluoridated, one wasn't, and they saw a significant rise, a statistically significant rise in the territory of um, the fluoridated group that was hypothyroid. So more hypothyroid patients in the fluoridated group. And it's the same thing. That fluoride molecule, because it's a halide, it can go in there and pinch hit for iodine. 
So those are the two big ones I'd say we got to be careful of. The next would be just all your xenoestrogens. The, tri the triclosan, which is the natural antibiotic, should they natural, it's the antibiotic that's in a lot of the soap products, that can be an issue. A lot of the estrogenic compounds that are in our pesticides, uh, organochlorines that are in our pesticides, a lot of the xenoestrogens that are in our plastics, these are all going to cause problems and antagonize um, thyroid hormone and antagonize our thyroid binding globulin. Yeah. More estrogen, whether it's from plastics or pesticides or birth control pills, that can increase our binding globulin and cause it to bind up our thyroid. And if our thyroid's bound up, it's not going to be able to bind into the receptor site. It's got to be free so it can go into the receptor site and do its thing. Yeah, estrogen dominance is a big problem because of the xenoestrogens, yeah. women taking hormone replacement therapy, especially unopposed with progesterone, uh, which some doctors are still doing uh, yeah. amazingly, and from birth control pills and uh, other forms of birth control, huge, huge problem with estrogen dominance. It is. And the first thing we can just all do is just get a really good, clean water filter. I'm, I, my, I have a whole house water filtration system as well as a countertop reverse osmosis that also has a step that infuses all the minerals back in. And I also pinch salt in, into my water as well. So I really drink super clean water that's double filtered and remineralized twice. So that's a big thing. Eat organic food, right? Avoid the all the junk food that's going to have the bromine in it. Be careful with your mattress. At least get something that you could put over it that's an airtight kind of uh, mattress cover so you're not getting the PBDEs, especially for your kiddos that are you know, they make all these baby products have to have PBDEs now in them, and it's terrible for the kids. Yeah, and so the, car, the car step. seats, too. The car seats have the flame yeah. retardants. And uh, every mattress in California has to be sprayed with flame retardants. And you're breathing, terrible. That, you're breathing that in every single night. Oh, yeah, and the majority of fires, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think they're caused by cigarettes. So unless your baby's smoking or something, <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, it shouldn't be an issue. So off the bat, I mean, those are the big ones from a diet and lifestyle standpoint. And the next is... Well, we'd want to do testing to see how your detox pathways are doing. So we talked about selenium being a really good precursor for glutathione, and a lot of people that have thyroid issues have low selenium. So if we take that out a couple steps, that they have low selenium, is a chance their glutathione pathways could be impaired. So I like running a good organic acid test that actually looks at all these organic acids, which are like the exhaust of our metabolism, and there's a whole set of them for um, the detox pathways. Yes. I'll actually read them out for you here. So a couple of the ones that I like for detoxification are 2-methylhipparate, orotate, glucarate, alpha-hydroxybutyrate, pyroglutamate, and sulfate. And these all correlate to the various sulfur amino acids and minerals that our body needs to run phase one and phase two detoxification. Yes. And so if we see these low, then we can actually pump up and give additional sulfur amino acids. We can recommend diet changes. We can recommend extra minerals. Uh, to actually help move these pathways faster and better and make them, make them go more efficiently. They're always working, it's just to what degree. And being in functional medicine world, we're trying to really focus on function and, and get things at their optimal level. People may not be in a, a pathological state, but they may just be you know somewhere below the average where they want to be above average in functioning. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the, uh, also the sulfur-containing amino acids uh, that are so yep. important. For NAC, methionine, yeah, taurine, glycine, glutamine, cysteine, exactly. All and those are all found in meat. So people that are not yep. eating meat that are vegetarian, which I found I was vegetarian for a couple of years, thyroid adrenal is completely tanked. I mean, they were definitely not functioning optimally prior to that experiment. Um, but uh, when I stopped eating meat, the, it destroyed my adrenal and thyroid health, and I really started manifesting a lot of symptoms, which uh, thankfully drove me to starting my website and uh, researching health and everything. Yeah. So you guys can thank me becoming vegetarian for uh, all the information I'm putting out. Uh, but so let's talk a little bit about uh, how important it is to eat the sulfur-containing amino acids in meat because there's not so many of those amino acids found in vegetables. Yeah, so in meats, you're typically getting more methionine and more lysine. Uh, these are really big um, sulfur-based compounds. Also, like things like bone broth, you're getting more proline, hydroxyproline. These are things that really help with the gut. Glycine as well. So these are really important. And we need glycine, we need cysteine, we need glutamine to make glutathione. So we need these amino acids to make our master antioxidant, glutathione. And a lot of the plant-based proteins, one, you got to eat a whole bunch of carbohydrate to get a little bit of protein. So in other words, Rice and beans, that's your typical veg vegetarian kind of uh, combination to get protein, complete amino acid. 
well, you got to get, I think, 60 to 70 grams of carbs for 15 grams of protein, right? That's or you can just have like, it's a lot of carbohydrate. I mean, I would need at least 40 per meal. I'm, I got to consume 150 carbs per meal. Forget it. I'd be like the State Park Marshmallow Man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're much better off having four to five ounces of grass-fed meat with some kale and some maybe some butter or something. Then you can get all this good protein, small amount of carbs, but the carbs are nutrient dense, right? And then you get all these extra sulfur amino acids that you're not going to get at high enough levels from vegetarian proteins. And yeah. then not to mention, you're just avoiding a lot of the um, mineral blockers or the mineral disruptors like the phytic acid and the oxalic, the oxalic acid and the lectin inhibit the lectins and all these trypsin inhibitors that break that affect how we break down protein which are all going to be in like our beans and all of our grains and all of our vegetarian protein. So we have problems with minerals, problems with proteins, and then we can't even break down what's in there efficiently because of those mineral and protein disruptors. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you're eating all those mineral and protein disruptors, um, you're also, you know, when you're blocking thyroid function to a certain degree, because you need the minerals in meat. A lot of people would think of meat as just protein, but that has those sulfur containing amino acids and they're mineral rich, which your thyroid and adrenals need to function. So definitely yeah. a, a, a double whammy you're getting if you are vegetarian, unfortunately. Yeah. And it takes about, I think, six pounds of chlorophyll or six pounds of grass for a grass-fed cow to accumulate that into one pound of meat. So when you think of meat, think of it as a bioaccumulated, like a superfood, a super concentration of all of this plant matter into one pound. So it's really a superfood and then glandulars or eating the actual glandular tissue, liver, etc. that's even like on top of that, that's like even more concentrated. So mm -hmm. you get the most bang for your buck really in animal proteins, yeah. animal foods. I agree. And do you think people, if they are vegetarian, that they have any hopes of being able to heal their, their thyroid? Well, I mean, off the bat, if you're vegetarian, one, if you're doing a lot of cruciferous vegetables, they're, that, those are like some of the best vegetables to eat, but you should at least make sure you're cooking them to break down some of the goitrogens. So the goitrogens are these things that block iodine, and we do need to make sure we're having whatever iodine we're getting in our diet to be absorbed so we can make um, thyroid hormones. So we don't want to disrupt it by eating a whole bunch of raw green vegetables like your broccoli and your Brussels sprouts. Yeah. So if you're vegetarian off the bat and you're, you know, you're really kind of stouched and like, I'm not going to change. Well, one, we got to at least cut out the crappy vegetarian foods like the grains and all of the, the fake soy stuff. Uh, get some free form amino acids on board that are already pre-broken down, ready to go, and at least be on a high quality pea protein that can supplement the amino acids you need without all the lectins and out all the carbohydrate along with it. So I have some patients that are vegan vegetarian and that we work with them to compromise sometimes with some egg yolks. So I know it's not necessarily vegan, but it's more vegetarian now. With some egg yolks, we'll add in free form aminos. We'll focus on safe starches, if they can handle the carbs, we'll focus on the right vegetables. If they're cruciferous, we'll steam them or saute them. Good fats, at least coconut oil based, at least avocado based, maybe some nut based. And we'll really just cut all the crap out of the vegetarian slide and I'll, I'll just slowly start to increase uh, supplemental aminos and kind of negotiate maybe adding in some plant uh, or some animal uh, proteins or glandulars if we can. Yeah, well, that's great. And I think that it's, you know, you have to try to supplement uh, the deficiencies in the vegetarian and vegan diet as much as you can. But ultimately, it's just a Band-Aid. I think there's just so much we don't yeah. know about nutrition. Uh, there's so many nutrients that we have yet to discover and whatnot. We know about 20,000 nutrients, but not all of them. And I think it's uh, it's uh, just a, a poor substitute at best. Um, but for some people, that's their choice uh, to do that. Yeah. And the choice really tends to be more emotional. And I just tell my vegetarian patients, anything you eat has to sustain life, all right? Um, I think it's kind of a misnomer to think that your plants really aren't that alive. I mean, I think if you read, I think it's Clive Baxter's book, The Strange World of Plants, where he hooks electrodes up to plants and, and kind of uh, approaches them with scissors, making this scissor kind of noise. <laughs> and the electrodes on the plants go crazy because the plants are like sensing what's going on. They're about to be dinner, if you will, or lunch maybe. So I think the whole idea that plants aren't alive or they aren't as sentient because we can't see their parents, we can't see their smiling faces, and we can't pet them like we can with animals, that they aren't alive. And I think they are, maybe not to our you know, sensory perception. So anything we eat, anything that nourishes our body has to be alive in some way or the other. Yeah. And just remember, you know, it takes life to sustain life. 
No, my uncle, he was uh, he was a hippie and he lived he lived in Austin, Texas. And nice. he not that you're a hippie, but <laughs> that's just what he was. And he was he was in love with gardening and growing vegetables. Yeah. And so he was trying to break the world's record for growing the world's tallest tomato plants. And one of the things wow. that he did was he talked to the plants and he sang to them every day. And he found the plants that he talked to and sang to, they grew much faster. And the plants that he didn't talk to and sing to, that they didn't grow as fast. So he unfortunately wow. only made it to 18 feet. <laughs> he didn't make it to the uh, the 30 feet uh, to break wow. the world record. Uh, but he got close. He was actually learning from the guy. He was, uh, uh, you know, being um, uh, he was men being mentored by the guy that had the 30 foot world record. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> but he, That's couldn't, crazy. he couldn't quite get there. Uh, but yeah. 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 So I look at it as like, you know, I give thanks for whatever food I'm eating. And I look at it all as the same, like, you know, thank you, bacon. Thank you, pig. Thank mm -hmm. you, kale. And I kind of have this like state of gratitude. It really helps kind of put me in that or that parasympathetic state so I can digest my food better, making sure I chew my food enough. And then really just remembering that all food has to have some level of life in it to sustain your life. And I think if vegetarians or vegans had more of that perspective, they would see that it's all life. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a really beautiful statement. Absolutely. And uh, so uh, one thing we forgot to mention was in talking about the, the toxic uh, chemicals that can affect the thyroid uh, is chlorine. Uh, we talked about oh, yeah. some of that. Oh, yeah, to mention that. Yeah, we, forgot, yeah. we talked about the other halogens, the, the bromine and the, um, the fluoride. But chlorine is a, a huge component uh, because if anyone goes swimming, they go on a jacuzzi, they're showering um, in tap water, they're breathing yep. in chlorine gas uh, or, th or they're cleaning with bleach. Um, which many people yep. do at many work offices. I think people are being just absolutely bombarded with chlorine every single day and it's depressing their thyroid function. It's why we have a thyroid epidemic in large part. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, get a good high quality water filter. Again, even a shower filter is essential. Shower filter is not as essential for fluoride because the molecule is much bigger. It can't quite fit to the skin but chlorine can vaporize and go through the skin. So you definitely want a shower filter if you don't have a whole, a whole house filter like myself. And you definitely want to make sure you have a good countertop filter or a whole house as well. What do you think is the most pressing health issue in the world today? What is the most pressing health issue in the world today? That's really tough. I would say it's a combination of you got to know where to get your information from. I think most people look to the government and look to TV to kind of provide them like what to eat. And I think a lot of the reason why we're in the situations we're in is because the government's made terrible recommendations via the food pyramid. We subsidize so much junk food in our country via all the grains and the corn subsidies. So junk food and all this crap's artificially cheap. I think a lot of people don't realize how much we've been kind of misled in that standpoint and we've been pushed in a direction where all this food that's super cheap is super bad for us. So I think making sure you really find good sources, whether on the internet or books and stuff you read, and educate yourself because it's going to be a bottom up approach in how we evolve with health. It's not going to be a top down. Like if you're looking for Obamacare or if you're looking for your conventional MD or for the government to give you the magic solution to be healthy. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be grassroots. So tune in to people like yourself, your podcast, my podcast, uh, good bloggers, good books. Get informed and try it. Again, you can kind of pick it up and put it on like it's a new suit. See how it feels. And most people that do what we say, they get energy and they feel better and they reverse a lot of their health issues just naturally. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely do not get health information from CNN or major newspapers and things like that. They're completely oh. biased. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean... Let's face it, there are six major companies, um, six major news networks, and majority, 60% of those ads are drug-based. Mm -hmm. And there's just no reason to put any nutritional information that could drop their sales, right? Yeah, absolutely. People eat good, yeah. Yeah, and they're not going to have any kind of ads or information or negative press about that's going to uh, fly in the face or insult their main uh, advertiser that's giving them all the money to, to run their show. So you have to be very, very careful about the information you get on CNN and other major news outlets. Oh yeah, major, major bias. So we just gotta remember that. So many people, today people are growing up on, on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, so they're getting a lot more exposure. 
where, you know, the, the baby boomers, they're kind of stuck in like, you know, whatever Fox or CNN or ABC says is kind of what, what's gold. So I think people are already evolving past that with just the internet, which is so great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So why don't you tell the listeners more about you and where they can find you and any kind of services that you offer at Saturn programs? Yeah. Great. Yeah, you can find me at justinhealth.com, kind of like my name, J-U-S-T-I-N-H-E-A-L-T-H.com. Also, my podcast over at beyondwellnessradio.com. We have full podcast transcriptions over there, and um, we have people like yourself and, and other great um, health advocates over there providing lots of great free information. And then my, my thyroid site, which is fixyourthyroid.com, which is really focused on getting to the root cause of thyroid issues. And just, I get lots of free information. Subscribe to my newsletter. If you're interested in getting more information on a, a patient uh, doctor level, feel free and sign up with me and we can talk about getting you to the next level. Great. Well, thank you so much, Justin. Thank you so much for coming on the show. That was so informative. And I know all the listeners are going to love it because I learned a little bit too myself. Um, Great. But <laughs> yeah, because I like how detailed you were with your descriptions awesome. and everything. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Wendy. I appreciate it. So listeners, if you want to learn all about detoxification and my version of paleo, modern paleo, and my healing program, my healing and detox program, Mineral Power, you can go to mineralpower.com and on my website, liveto110.com. Thank you so much for listening to the Live to 110 podcast. Thanks, Thank man. you so much for coming on the show. Well, it's my pleasure. Well, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and uh, you know how you got into methylation and hair mineral analysis and writing your book, Nutrient Power? Well, for me, it all started uh, when I was working as a scientist at Art Guy National Laboratory, and I was uh, got involved as a prison volunteer. And I found myself dealing with people who were on death row, people who were stateful penitentiary. And... Um, Within a rather short time, I found myself the head of a group of uh, 125 volunteers doing the kind of do-gooder things people do in prisons. And uh, along the way, uh, we started an ex-offender program, and I got to meet the families that had produced a criminal. And that's when my education really began, because I, 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 I had always thought that people that were criminals were that way because of, of some kind of a flawed upbringing or their life experiences. And I kept meeting occasional, just wonderful families who seemed to have done everything right, and they had other siblings, other children who were just fine, upstanding citizens, and yet this one person had done a really horrible thing, or a number of crimes. And they told me that, they, that this um, future criminal was different from the time he was about six or eight months old, that it happened so early, and they were just very troubled by this child and uh, even though they seem to do everything right. So I began to ask, what's the real cause, the real reason for behavior disorder? And at that time, since I was at a national laboratory, I started diving into the literature and science. And that's how it really started. And I got, um, I, I started doing studies, um, in, the, in the beginning, a lot of it was hair analysis, by the way. And I was studying um, hair, hair, blood, and urine um, from ex-convicts and prison residents. And um, I, um, at one point, Dr. Carl Pfeiffer, if you're familiar with who he is, mm -hmm. uh, the great man uh, who was probably at that time, back in the, in the 1970s, was considered the world's best or leading uh, nutritional scientist and nutritional doctor. He was an MD, PhD. And uh, when I first met him, he had just been nominated for a Nobel Prize which he did not get. It uh, turns out that, that Linus Pauling had and dominated him. Anyway, uh, he got interested in my work and actually we collaborated for 12 years. And I started sending him criminals. We, I would, we would take a plane to Princeton, New Jersey and I would bring in criminals fresh out of prison. And Anyway, we started studying their biochemistry. He started developing treatment programs. And then uh, after, after by 1988, we had, we had done about 500 people together, 500 cases of violent people. And what we learned was that the criminals would get really better for about a year or two, 